Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. My name is Brianne Roth. I am the Public Programs Coordinator here at the Nantucket Historical Association, and I want to thank you all for coming out tonight for what is sure to be a very special concert. Before we get things started, if everyone could please take a moment to make sure your cell phones are on silent um, so we do not disrupt tonight's performance. And just to give you a little background on tonight's um, performer, we bring you um, a program called In Celebration of the Earth um, with uh, Paul Winter. Winter is a saxophonist and composer and a seven-time Grammy Award winner. His musical odyssey has long embraced the traditions of the world's cultures, as well as the wildlife voices of what he refers to as the greater symphony of the earth. From the early days of his college jazz sextet, which toured Latin America for the State Department and performed the first ever jazz concert at the White House for the Kennedys in 1962, to his later ensemble, the Paul Winter Consort, his concert tours and recording expeditions have taken him to 52 countries and to wilderness areas on six continents where he has traveled on rafts, dog sleds, mules, kayaks, tugboats, and land rovers. Paul has recorded 45 albums, of seven, have, seven of which have been honored with the Grammy Awards. Since 1980, Paul and his consort have been artists in residence at New York's Cathedral of St. John the Divine, where, he, where they have presented over 200 unique events, including their famed annual Winter Solstice and the Summer Solstice celebrations. Please join me in giving a warm round of applause to Paul Winter.
Thank you very much, and good evening, and welcome, and thank you to all of you for coming to be with me here tonight. It's a great privilege to be back in this amazing museum again, and uh, I want to share with you tonight some music that has been inspired by different travels that I've made and recording in the wilderness um, with the voices of different creatures that we've encountered, and also, as you heard in the first piece, the music of my two-legged colleagues who are with me tonight on tape. I, I couldn't begin this program uh, in any other way than by celebrating the creature that is probably the most ancient musician on the planet, certainly the largest, the whale. And some of you may have been here last year for the program that I had the privilege of doing with my great friend, Dr. Roger Payne, who had recorded the humpback whales. But for um, those who were not, who maybe don't quite know what we talk about when we refer to whale songs, Roger, in the 60s, with underwater microphones near Bermuda, <coughs> recorded humpback whales, and in analyzing hundreds of hours of the recordings, stumbled on the discovery that sometimes these long patterns that they sing, uh, they're, they're sometimes as long as 30 minutes, they repeat exactly. Uh, something as complex as a Beethoven symphony that takes 30 minutes and then they repeat it verbatim. And all the whales in that area are singing that long pattern. And so it therefore qualifies for our definition of song, something repeated. You come back the next year and put your hydrophone in the water and you find that they have a new song and they're all singing it as if there were some kind of top 40 in the underwater <laughs> world. Um, and although we probably will never know exactly what they're singing, uh, we do know that we, we suspect it's a mating song because it's the males who sing and it may be that the, uh, the greatest singer is the one that wins the, uh, the prize. Um, so, um, in any case, what I've done, having wondered how I could take the magic of the, their voices to people through our music, I thought, I wonder if I could find a passage in one of their recordings that I could play on soprano sax. And Roger, whom I had met in this process in, in the late 60s, was generous enough to, to loan me a few hours of tapes, and I listened and listened, and I found this one pattern that I could play. Most of their songs are swooping. Uh, they don't land on these stair steps of notes that we're used to. They swoop through. But in this one passage, the whale played several times, or sang, excuse me, these notes. So I thought, well, let me see what I can do with those eight notes. So we... <clears throat> decided to harmonize them with human harmonies and uh, begin the piece with the whale's voice, which I can somewhat imitate on the sax, and uh, create a piece that evoked for me something about the um, nature of the whales that I eventually learned after having spent some time with a Greenpeace expedition where they put me in a small zodiac in the water near the whales and um, we floated with them as they were feeding, and it was no great feat of daring, because many people have done that, and the whales have never harmed anybody, have no reason to. And it, what struck me was not so much their hugeness and their, their power, but their gentleness, the beautiful slow motion grace with which they emerge from the water every so often to, to blow and to breathe. And so I thought I wanted to make a piece that spoke to that, that aspect of them. And at the time I was working on it, I had just seen a very disturbing video of the annual seal hunt in Newfoundland where they club these baby seals to death when they're two weeks old to get their fur for making um, lining for gloves and trinkets for their rearview mirror and things totally unnecessary. Um, and I thought, well, since they say that the whale songs travel very, very far in the sea, hundreds of miles, because water is a great medium for conducting sound. And Roger had hypothesized that before the pollution from ship's motors in the ocean, that a, hump, uh, that a whale song could go all the way around the world. We'll never know. 
But I thought, well, maybe I could imagine that this is the song, uh, a lullaby, a song of protection from this largest creature in the sea, being sent out to protect these tiny ones when the seal hunters come. So from that came the title for this, the lullaby from the great mother whale for the baby seal pups.
I'd like to take you now to the Grand Canyon, a place of pilgrimage for me for decades, um, until I finally got the chance to do a, a river trip there. Um, I had gone uh, first in years ago when we did our first cross-country tour of the United States out old Route 66, and like most tourists, stopped at the canyon. I remember sitting on the edge of the South Rim and playing my horn. I had no idea of ever playing in the wilderness at that time, but listen as the sound just evaporated in this sea of air between me and the North Rim, 13 miles across. But um, I remember wondering if there weren't some amazing echoes if you took your horn to the bottom of the canyon, a mile below where I was sitting, and played. I thought no more about it until seven years later I came back through the Southwest. And this time I hiked down part of the, the Bright Angel Trail and found some of those echoes and then stepped off the trail as the mule train went by, carrying the tourists, and thought, well, I could maybe bring the band down and strap the cello and the drums on these mules, and we could make an album there. Well, over the next few years, I found a better way to see the Grand Canyon is not on mules, but on rafts. Um, and uh, we did our first river rafting recording expedition in the early 80s, um, a three-week trip, uh, unforgettable, and recorded in all these different places inside canyons and thought, wow, this is amazing, but we really need to come back again if we're gonna be serious about this because you don't get to stay too long in each place. So I came back for the second time after which we had about 100 hours of recordings, which is enough for 100 albums, but uh, I thought, oh, I've gotta come one more time and just uh, stay longer in a, special, in a couple of special places. Finally, on, after the third trip, I thought we better <clears throat> get this album done and we're gonna go broke in this process. So um, we put together an album called Canyon from which this piece comes. Uh, you'll hear in the beginning of it um, a voice that was with us every day of all of those trips, a little bird called the Canyon Wren. Um, and we endeavored here to evoke something of the feeling of being on these rubber rafts in which we travel each day with a kind of motion they made in the water and the kind of emotion you experience going through the different rapids that that journey presents. I call this one River Run.
few years ago, I had a, an unusual request from a, an art publisher who publishes limited edition prints of some renowned artists. And one of them had done a painting about a scene in the Rocky Mountains and thought maybe we could do a companion album to this painting by an artist named Bev Doolittle, who's famous for a genre called camouflage art, in which there are, in the landscapes, mostly in the West, are different animals, sometimes Native Americans, that you don't see at first, and then you realize that, oh, that boulder, there's actually a grizzly bear, and there's some Native Americans hiding back here. And <clears throat> it's quite a remarkable painting called Prayer for the Wild Things, done in a, on a, a, a a crag, a mountain crag at 12,000 feet in the Rockies um, with 26 animals and birds of the, of the northern Rockies camouflaged in the painting. And on top of the crag is an Indian holy man with his arms upstretched praying. So went out there uh, in uh, at July with my wife Ches to see this site and find out what music it might evoke. And we climbed up there on a beautiful July afternoon and sat on this crag looking down <clears throat> at the shadows moving across the valleys on either side of us a mile below. And um, it was totally silent except for occasionally the sound of the wind and a distant raven. And I thought, I wonder if I could use voices from both cultures that have lived on this land, the Native American and the European and um, then seek out the different creatures uh, after we do our opening overture. Um, and using for the, for the European tradition instruments from the symphonic world that are not that often heard, like the contrabass clarinet and the hecklephone bassoon and English horn, French horn. Um, and from the Native American, the voices of Arlie Neskahai and the White Eagle singers along with their drums. <clears throat> so I'd like to play a suite from this album for you. It's I, too long to do the whole thing, but um, give you some sense of these adventures. Uh, beginning with the overture at this site, which we called Eagle Mountain, um, with uh, our earth band of these symphonic instruments and the voices of Arlene Neskahai and the White Eagle singers. Eagle Mountain.
As in our various trips in the Grand Canyon, our first quest was to find an acoustic space where uh, there would be some resonance, maybe some echo. Uh, I've often felt that it, it was kind of like the earth answering you when you play in a space like that. Um, and uh, we found our first acoustic space on the Missouri River near Helena, Montana, at a place called Gates of the Mountain that has a 2,000 foot limestone cliffs on the opposite side of the river. So we spent several days there. I would play um, and record different themes that I had brought with me or things that, themes that came to me uh, with some of the birds that, that were around there. But um, this one morning, um, I was playing on the bank and as I always do with my eyes closed. And unbeknownst to me, a flock of migrating Canadian geese were floating down the river toward me, obviously resting in their long migration. And uh, as they got close enough to me, I guess to realize that I was a phenomenon too strange to tolerate, they erupted into flight with this flurry of wing beats that so startled me that I stopped playing. But then they circled back overhead, honking, as if to say, well, don't worry, we'll finish the piece for you. <laughs> and uh, so this is one that I'd like you to hear just as it happened. I can't quite recreate it. Um, it's simply called On the River. continued their migration. Um, and um, after, after this experience in um, Gates of the Mountains, we went to Yellowstone um, seeking the grizzly bears. Um, and uh, our guide there was a man we had met through Bev Doolittle, the artist named Dr. Steve French, who was a medical doctor who worked half the year at a small uh, hospital emergency room in Wyoming, and the rest of the year worked to study the grizzlies to find out their ha about more about their habitat, um, which is under threat, and they're <clears throat> they're ranging in the in the in the uh, upper uh, stretches of Yellowstone, and he let us know right away that it wasn't a great idea to try to get too close to a grizzly bear with a tape recorder, um, but he did take us where we saw some of them at a distance, and then ended up with. Uh, using the recording of a captive grizzly bear cub, uh, they make a purring sound after they suckle. And so that's what we used in the, uh, 
in the album for the Grizzly Voice. Um, but we had also hoped to hear Elk on that trip, and we had timed the visit so it would be around the 15th of September, which is the beginning of the elk rutting season. And he said, I, I know I can take you to a place where you're gonna absolutely hear the elk, a small valley in an area that not too many people go to. And uh, he took us out <coughs> in his pickup truck, uh, the, the us being my wife, Ches, and our sound engineer, Mickey Houlihan, and I, um, on a completely dark, moonless night on these old roads to this uh, ridge above the, this small valley. And so we set up the tape recorder on the hood of the pickup and a telescope mic that goes up 30 feet. And I thought, well, I'll go down this road about 100 yards, so I'm far enough away from the mic that if we do get a response from the elk, I won't be louder than him. <clears throat> um, I had never heard the elk myself, but I'd heard about them for years. And I knew that they did some sort of a bugling kind of call where they force uh, air through their, their windpipes and, and produce sounds the way a brass player does, a French horn or a trumpet player. So I played a kind of arpeggiated figure and immediately got a response from a bull elk down below. I mean, that's so rare when you, something happens that quickly. And I thought, wow, amazing. So I kept playing. And he kept answering most every phrase that I played. And then um, I thought, oh, wow, what if they're not, the machine's not working and we miss this as a chance of a lifetime. So I went back to the truck and they assured me that it sounded great and uh, they were getting it all. And Dr. Steve, who's a Texan and has a kind of laconic way of expressing himself, he said, you know, Paul, the, the elk might charge you. I said, oh, thank you for telling me. Well, what, what do you recommend? He said, well, just find a tree and dance around the tree. And you're good. So I walked back down to my post, thinking, how could I even find a tree in this darkness, much less dance around it? But suddenly it dawned on me that, that this was an unusual experience among all the times I played in the wilderness, that for the elk, this was not so much an aesthetic experience, but it was more about testosterone. Because um, he's bugling to challenge the other males to see who gets the females, the, the harem. So I thought, okay, so for now, for all practical purposes, I'm a bull elk. And I just have to, you know, live up to that. So <laughs> I, I thought, you know, I'll hear him if he's coming up. They, I, I think I could beat it back to the truck. I'm not that worried. So I played again, and once again he answered. And it was amazing. And I thought, I've got to make sure they're getting it. So I went back to the truck, and they assured me it was fine. And this time, Dr. Steve said, uh, you know, the grizzly go after the elk this time of year. <laughs> and he says, guess how they find them? And I thought, oh, well, thanks again for letting me know about that. Uh, what do you recommend? He said, would you feel better if I walked down the road there with you? And I said, I certainly would, because, I mean, if I'm playing with my eyes closed in the dark, I can't really be aware of something coming up behind me. So I um, went down the road. and. <clears throat> I played and nothing, nothing untoward happened. But I realized then that um, this is the first time in all the decades I've played in wilderness areas that I felt some fear. Because in our continent, we have eradicated most all the creatures that could be dangerous to us, except maybe the grizzlies. And um, a year or so later, my wife and I were in the Serengeti, where if you are not in your Land Rover, you have a lot to fear because the original family of life is still there. So it made me realize how much we've lost and made me more fervent about protecting what we have left. This is one I'd also like you to hear as it happened. However, I'd like to ask that the lights be turned out. And since we'll still have some daylight, um, my goal is to have you imagine being on the ridge in Yellowstone on a pitch black midnight. So you might want to close your eyes for the rest of this suite, um, which I think will go much better in the dark. So Brianna is going to go and take care of the. Uh... Yeah. This piece um, I call Elk Horns.
And the French horn takes over here, who is the spirit ally of, of the uh, elk in the album. Um, we'll leave the lights out for a while. I'll let you know, Brianna, when we turn them on again. Um, there's one more piece I'd like to have you hear as it happened. Um, we went from there to Glacier National Park to listen for the wolves. And um, our guide there was uh, Dr. Bob Ream from the University of Montana, who had worked for years with a pack of wolves that had come down from Canada some uh, years before that. Uh, at, at the time, I started uh, seeking out wolves in, in, the, uh, in the 70s. There were no, uh, there were the 700 wolves in the lower 48 states having been exterminated from all 50, uh, the, 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 the space, the, the places where all 50 states became since uh, Europeans came here 500 years ago. And then this pack uh, came over from the Canadian Rockies and since then there have been many more wolves come down. Um, we arrived in Pole Bridge in Northern Glacier Late one night, it was raining, and um, we first thought, well, let's make camp, and we'll go look for the wolves tomorrow. But I realized we didn't have too many nights there, and um, I thought, let's give it a try, even though I knew that the rain would ruin a recording, because raindrops on a microphone are not, are not so great. Um, so we, we went out to a, a remote logging road, not far from a meadow, where Dr. Reen said he had heard the wolves. And these wolves travel 100, their territory is 100 square miles. So it's a needle in a haystack kind of quest, and he did not have any of them radio collared. So it was just a fluke, but I thought, I, in, in the years I've played for wolves, probably 90% of the time I've never gotten a response. But each time I've felt, I've, I've loved it anyway, because I imagined them being out there. It was a thrill to be in their territory. So we set up the machine, the recording machine on the hood and I, the mic, and I went down the road and played two howl-like phrases, and amazingly, the wolves were there. And later, when we heard the recordings, I was thrilled to find out that not only had the rain not ruined the recording, but it had given it a kind of poignant quality that made it unique among the recordings I've been able to do with wolves. This one I call the North Fork Wolves in the Midnight Rain.
Now, lest you think I'm some sort of Pied Piper, um, the wolves love to howl, and they'll howl at a freight train whistle. Um, for them, it's um, a ritual they participate in several times during a day, uh, perhaps to celebrate their togetherness, to announce to neighboring packs that they're there and they're strong. We're not sure, but um, they, they love to give voice, and, uh, and I certainly love to hear them. Um, I want to play the finale now of this suite from Prayer for the Wild Things. Um, it begins with a kind of reverse overture in which each of the instruments um, that I had chosen for the ensemble are related to one of the creatures, so that the um, contrabass clarinet is the, uh, is the moose, the hecophone is the, uh, uh, the buffalo, the cello, the grizzly bear, the English horn, the mountain goat, the bassoon is, is the mountain lion, um, the French horn, the elk, and I get to be the wolf. Um, this first part of it is called Night into Dawn. Going back then into Ar Arlene Eskahai and the White Eagle Singers, this time with us playing along with them, ending up where we began on Eagle Mountain.
entire house, just the original setup. I like to go now into the sunshine. Uh, today was one of those beautiful days I recall anywhere. And what a privilege to be in Nantucket and to get to go to the beach with my wife and daughter. Um, made me think of Brazil, where I have spent a lot of time and had my, most of my great beach experience. And this is a piece from an album I did. Uh, they are called Brazilian Days. Uh, I'd like to have it be a salute to the Nantucket sun. four-legged collaborator in this piece who gave us, gave me uh, the seed theme and who sang some of the bluesiest solo howls that I could ever hope to hear from a 
even a blues singer. And this was another wolf, uh, which a friend of mine recorded in the wild in northern Minnesota, and found that the, the wolf had howled four different phrases and then repeated them. Uh, the only case that we ever found of a wolf doing what the whales do. But uh, the first set was enough for me musically. And I had had the chance to go there. Uh, it was my first experience howling in the wild with this friend, a, a wolf biologist who was working in northern Minnesota at that time. And we would go out at night and howl with our own voices <clears throat> and listen to hear if there might be anybody in the neighborhood. Uh, once in a while, on a lucky night, we'd hear way off in the distance this kind of lonely and lazy sounding voice begin to rise into the night. And then the others would join, as you heard in the, in the uh, Glacier Park experience. But they went on for a long time. And then it dawned on me, maybe they're not just answering us. But for them, this is a ritual that's very important. Um, and I thought, maybe we, as a much younger species, could learn something from these elders of ours about the importance of that kind of ritual each day, giving voice together in whatever way we might want. And one of the fantasies I've harbored since then, if we could get Congress to howl together in the morning, <laughs> maybe we could get a better spirit happening down there. Um, and <laughs> that's one of the fantasies. We actually got it going in the UN General Assembly uh, on World Environment Day uh, a couple of decades ago, not with the, all the delegates. It was in that chamber, but we had our own, own audience. And uh, so I thought, well, there's a, there's a breakthrough for the, the, uh, this larger family of life. Um, hearing them in the night was, for me, a wonderful mu musical experience. I loved this chorus. And I, I knew that wolves are not a threat to humans, as we also found out about the whales in this, our era, in the last, say, well, I won't include you, let's say the last recent decades, so before some of your times. But anyway, um, for me, it was a feeling of a kind of deep peace inside when I heard those voices, because I felt reconnected to this larger family of which we were once a more integral part. And for those moments, in a sense, I felt whole. And I wanted to make music about this gentle side of these creatures who've been so misunderstood and mistreated by us for so long. And um, the, the title for this came from the, uh, the eyes of a wolf, uh, a captive wolf, who looked back at me with these amber eyes in which I sensed not only his curiosity about me, but this wisdom of 30 million years of heritage, which is more than 100 times as long as our species, Homo sapiens, has even been around. And I was, I've never been able to describe in words how that felt. And so I'm grateful to have music to make an attempt in this piece I call Wolf Eyes.
always invite you all to join me in a hallelujah chorus for Mother Earth. One more piece, and now that we've all howled together, <laughs> singing together should be a breeze, right? This song has a chorus, and I'd love to have your help with it. And the words go, in a circle of friends, in a circle of sound, all our voices will blend when we touch common ground. In a circle of friends, in a circle of sound, all our voices will blend when we touch common ground. It's the title song from an album called Common Ground. I'll tell you when your part comes in. <laughs> Voices are calling round the earth Music is rising in the sea The spirit of morning fills Guiding my journey home Where is the path beyond the forest? Where is the song I always knew? I remember it just around the bend In the village the music never ends In a circle of friends In a circle of sound All our voices will end When we touch
huge um, thank you again to Paul Winter. Huge round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> At this time, I would like to invite everyone upstairs. We do have a rooftop reception. Um, so you're welcome to take the elevator here off to the right, or if you head to the lobby, there is a staircase to the rooftop. So we hope to see you upstairs. And thank you all tonight. <laughs>